Hello and welcome to another episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. I'm the titular Sean. And I'm the very titular Carrie. It's the show that takes you inside the unbelievable, the unexplainable, the macabre, and the bizarre and tries to find an answer. Hello, Caroline. Hey. I want to take care of a little bit of um a little bit of listener correspondence off the top. Um we've we've had uh a little bit of a We've had a nice back and forth, I think, on uh, mm-hmm. both Instagram and uh, our email with a listener, and um, it brought up a couple of things we just want to address to, or I do at least, uh, to, I don't know, bring some clarity to the last episode about her Baumeister. Mm-hmm. Definitely, by the way, go back and listen to that episode if you haven't. I think it's a really um, interesting, horrifying story. But this listener, Keith, I'm, I'm going to leave his last name out just because I don't know if he wants me to identify him um, specifically or not. Uh, but Keith reached out to us on Instagram first. He actually lives in Indianapolis now, I believe, Carrie, and certainly did um, at the time of her Baumeister's uh, murders. And so Keith reached out to point out a few uh, inaccuracies, inconsistencies in, in our version of the story. And some clarifications as well, I would say. Yeah. Um, I had passed along, which, which I had read in our source book, uh, Where the Bodies Are Buried, um, this impression that parts of the gay community in Indianapolis had sort of a, well, you know... Um, I think wh- you had kind of said the older members of the community were maybe feeling that some of the younger members were being a little reckless. Yeah, like almost, I I don't think I said a they're getting what's coming to them thing, but I, you know, I I think I leaned too far far Kind of a a what would they expect sort of thing. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And um, that certainly is the characterization in the book. But Keith said that uh, that's not really, not only is that not the whole picture, that's not really any part of the picture um, at the time. Mm-hmm. He said it was actually re- very much a closed ranks solidarity, um, everyone kind of sharing the same fear thing, it sounds like. And uh, I- I'll just quote from his email a little bit here. Um, Keith says, The gay community in Indianapolis at that time was very closed. Bible thumpers had protested everything they could take a church bus to. Gay Pride on the Circle was protested. Miss Gay USA Finals at the Indiana Roof Ballroom was protested. Every time the gay community peeked out of the closet, there was some bigot there to try and slam that door shut again. Now imagine all that going on, as well as the hate from the spread of AIDS, which was killing us in large numbers, and the Republican government had decided to do as little as possible. The gay community knew before anyone else that people were disappearing, but since we had good reason to distrust the police as being unsympathetic, who were we supposed to tell? So we did just what we could to protect ourselves, as I've outlined previously. Keith also mentions his friend, Jerry Williams Comer, who he says was another Baumeister victim, one of those at least three and probably more and possibly many more victims that were never identified um, besides the eight who we named in the last episode. So Jerry Williams Comer, who... Uh, published the SARJ guide with his partner. That was one of the uh, gay papers Mm -hmm. that they would distribute in the um, um, nightclubs in the scene around that time. So um, a little in memoriam to Jerry Williams Comer, who uh, doesn't, you know, isn't listed among the official victims, but uh, according to Keith, uh, very much was part of the tragedy of Herb Baumeister. Yeah, and we really appreciate Keith reaching out to us. We had a really great conversation with him. Uh, I think it's the duty of any true crime podcast to take these personal experiences and really make them a part of the coverage, Um, especially with things that are so recent like this. I mean, it's, you know, a few decades ago, but this isn't some old timey mystery. This isn't the Salem witch trials, you know, this is something that people who are listening might actually have experience with. And it's really important to us to get the facts right. Uh, Especially in this case, I think we both consider ourselves very passionate allies of the gay community. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's really important to us to represent things correctly And it it was certainly a difficult time in the community's history. Um, 
if misinformation, you know, everything is about learning from it. So hopefully in that time, the the authorities learned from their um, inaction, mm-hmm. I guess, due to homophobia to not do that again. But if you don't get the facts right, then the, the learning's not going to happen. So it's really important to us that we get the facts right, um, especially nowadays. I mean, there are still crimes being committed against sex workers, trans people, trans people of color, people of color in general. And we as I'm, I mean, I'm just speaking as myself and Sean, you know, we're two white cishet people, pretty average but we it's it's our jobs to kind of stand up for those marginalized people in, a, in at least getting the facts right all of the time as much as we can again we we were bound by source material but um to get those facts right in honor of those victims and to to try and make sure this ha- doesn't happen again i mean we're kind of a more lighthearted show we also do paranormal and aliens and all that fun stuff but we do take the crime stories very seriously and the research of the stories very seriously. And um, perspective like this is really valuable. And we are just thankful for Keith to writing in for us, to us and also kind of presenting this perspective very thoughtfully and respectfully and not just like coming at our throats for getting something wrong. Uh, yeah, Keith was super sweet. And uh, that's a really valuable thing to have from our audience in general Mm -hmm. Uh, anyway because we are only a two-person uh crew here we are our entire research team uh we're off in this case we are working from you know sources that are a little older Mm -hmm. and uh, a little more obscure and god having some actual firsthand you know experience well i'm sorry that keith had to live through um this time and place um that experience is so valuable for uh keeping us you know, accountable. Well, uh, accountable, but also useful. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, in sharing these stories, some of them are, are meant to just be fun and entertaining, not the crime ones. But you know, your paranormal stories, um, your your weird little historical stories, things like that. But when we do true crime, even if we are more lighthearted in our discussion. Uh, we do want to be as accurate as possible and as respectful to the victims as possible. I think that's always been a major goal. We we might call her Baumeister gross and a, a little <laughs> weirdo with a baby face, but um, uh, you know we we can make fun of him. We would never make fun of victims, and we we hope that we present these stories um, as accurately and respectfully as possible. And thanks again to Keith for writing in. Um, I think Keith was very thoughtful and, um, you know, he also put a lot of emotional work into writing to us because I'm sure this was painful and still is. Um, So we appreciate it. And if anyone ever has any feedback or personal experience with the stories we discussed, please let us know. We would love to talk to you. Yeah. And thank you, Keith. We're uh, very lucky to have you as a listener. Now, Caroline, what are we talking about this week on the pod? Well, as our listeners probably know, I am a huge rock music fan, especially older, oldies and and, and classic rock. Careful, oldies means everything (laughs) up to like Nirvana now? I know, classic rock, certainly. I think someone said something about My Chemical Romance being played on a a classic rock station. It makes me want to barf. I mean, (laughs) it's almost 20 years old. Jesus Christ. Well, I do love learning about rock music history. And since we've covered Is Elvis Alive and Paul is Dead, it's time to go back a bit and investigate one of the first great tragedies in rock and roll, The Day the Music Died. A long, long time ago, I can still remember how that music used to make me smile. And I knew if I had my chance That I could make those people dance And maybe they'd be happy for a while But February made me shiver With every paper I'd deliver Bad news on the doorstep I couldn't take one more step 
I can't remember if I cried when I read about his widowed bride But something touched me deep inside the day The music died That song is definitely too long, <laughs> but it is beautiful. It is. He has a beautiful voice. I think I love the lyrics. It's very story-esque and metaphorical. And um, our listeners might recognize, I, I would assume, this bit of the song American Pie by Don McLean, as you said. Uh, it is a sprawling eight and a half minute folk rock song. And it was inspired by The Day the Music Died, which was the name for February 3rd, 1959, when rock stars Buddy Holly, J.P., The Big Bopper Richardson, and Richie Valens were killed in a plane accident between two stops on the Winter Dance Party concert tour near Clear Lake, Iowa. Yes, this is The Big Bopper speaking. <laughs> 1959 was a particularly transitory period in music. It was the end of the 50s. Uh, pop was starting to edge toward rock and roll and bands from the crooners and doo-wop of the 40s and 50s. The Newport Folk Festival began and was one of the first modern music festivals in America. And Elvis Presley was halfway through his U.S. Army service in Germany. So... No Elvis, no new Elvis singles, or was he recording from Germany? Well, what's interesting, I, I don't quite recall if he was recording in Germany, but they had come up with a backlog of several singles, um, thanks to the Colonel, his manager, and they released no, that was, that them. That was Colonel Sanders, right? <laughs> they released them um, little by little during his two years in the service, so he never really fell out of the public eye when it came to music, but he was away. Just like Tupac. <laughs> sure. It's like all of Tupac's posthumous albums. <laughs> the death of some of the brightest names in music at the time would become the first of those loss of innocence moments the era would face into the 70s, which should include the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, the beginning of the Vietnam War, the violent end of the Summer of Love with the Manson family murders, and the tragic deaths at the Altamont Speedway Free Festival. Now, except for the Speedway deaths and this, those other things are um, like human evil. Yes, but the, they were heavily represented in music. Yeah, but but these two things aren't. This isn't like oh, I feel disillusioned about humanity now. This is you know tragedy. Yeah, mm -hmm. a bummer. So maybe the day the music died was only a harbinger of things to come. One thing is for certain, it completely changed the traje trajectory of music history and perhaps gave rock and roll the touch of darkness it's still thought to have today. Oh, mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. Before we go any further, we want to let you know that this episode is sponsored by one of our favorite local record stores, Static Era Records. Jay's back! Yeah, he, he uh, the, the Jay, our friend over there, and Static Era also sponsored our other music history episodes. Static Era is an independent record label with a brick-and-mortar shop just steps from the Metro North platform in Milford, Connecticut, and it features new releases and used vinyl all in different genres of music and even purchases or trades for the vinyl you might have sitting around. So check them out at staticerarecords.com and let, you know, let them know that Ain't It Scary sent you. Yep, um, great people selling great music, and the brick-and-mortar local record store is a very endangered species, <laughs> so you, you really have to support them to keep them around. And for this episode, we'll be using, among our sources, the book Take a Walk on the Dark Side by R. Gary Patterson, who you may remember as the author of The Walrus Was Paul from our Paul is Dead episode. And we also reference the VH1 Behind the Music episode on The Day the Music Died and other clippings and quotes from biographies on Buddy Holly, J.P. Big Bopper Richardson, and Richie Valens. So now let's take it back to the careers of Holly, Richardson, and Valens and what landed them on that plane during that tour on that fateful February night 63 years ago. Charles Hardin Holly, who came to be known as Buddy Holly, was born in Lubbock, Texas on September 7th, 1936, to a musical family. And 
he got the nickname after the movie Elf or? <laughs> I think that was a little after his time. He began learning guitar around the age of 11 and decided to pursue a full-time career in music by 1955. After graduating from high school, galvanized by seeing Elvis Presley himself perform live in Lubbock. Sure. I mean, who wouldn't be inspired after that? Yeah, probably all kinds of karate. (laughs) Inspired by the king, he shifted his style from country and western to rock and roll and began to record music with later bandmates like Jerry Allison. By the next time Presley came around, Holly was opening for him. And in October of 1955, Holly and co. were booked as the opening act for Bill Haley and his Comets. Oh my God, the, 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 those who rock around the clock. Mm-hmm. One of the first rock and roll songs uh, ever to reach mainstream popularity. And Nashville talent scout Eddie Crandall was in attendance for this show. Crandall was impressed and worked to get Holly signed to a label. Eventually, Holly landed at Decca Records in 1956, but after a year of recording with them, he was left unsatisfied and unfulfilled. Um, Because they were stepping in too much, or? Just wasn't going how he wanted it to go. Okay. In January 1957, Holly's contract was not renewed, so I guess they felt the same way. Oh. And he decided to form a band with Allison, but bassist Joe B. Molden and rhythm guitarist Nikki Sullivan to record demos and hopefully get picked up by another label. Mm. Mm. That's how you do <laughs> Very it. Very knowing. This demo, which included the song That'll Be the Day, was received warmly by Brunswick Records, who required the band to release under a full band name rather than Holly's name, since the song was originally recorded at DECA under Buddy Holly's name. So oh. they had to come up with a band name, basically. Okay, so you can do the same song, though? I guess. It, it, it turned into some weird legality thing. But at this point, the band The Crickets were officially formed. That'll Be the Day was released as a single in May 1957, and by the end of their stretch at the Apollo between August 16th and 22nd, the song was climbing the charts, and Holly appeared on Dick Clark's American Bandstand on August 26th. That'll Be the Day soon hit the top of the charts, and Peggy Sue and Every Day, two very popular songs, shortly followed. Though the latter was originally just a B-side, it is one of my favorite Buddy Holly tunes. Every day it's a getting closer, going faster than a roller coaster. Love like yours will surely come my way. Hey, hey, hey. Every day it's a getting faster. Everyone said go ahead and ask her. Love like yours will surely come my way. If you're waiting for it to kick in, (laughs) adjust for the 60s. It's a vibe. And this is the late 50s, remember? Uh, And I think that does also confirm that I do have the musical taste of both the emo kid from your high school in the early 2000s and your elderly grandma. Yes. (laughs) Also in the early 2000s. (laughs) Probably. Their first complete album, The Chirping Crickets, Very original. <laughs> was released in November, and The Crickets performed on The Ed Sullivan Show in December. In January 1958, Holly recorded Rave On, uh, a song, and his debut solo album, Buddy Holly, was released in March. So he's doing all this stuff all at once. Yeah, absolutely. And that Buddy Holly had that great music video where he was in the Happy Days Diner. You're just confusing people. That's Weezer. We'll talk about them later. Okay. Oh, we are going to talk about Weezer (laughs) later? I mentioned Weezer. You got to. Uh, The Crickets joined disc jockey Alan Freed's Big Beat Show concert tour for 41 dates soon after, and both Buddy Holly solo and the Crickets together continued recording new material. Now, why? Why? Why what? Why keep recording as the Crickets? And separately, Buddy Holly, I, I think he just had so much material that he he just needed to get it out. Adam Levine before uh, Adam Levine. Does he have a solo career? I think. I don't think so. Doesn't he have so? I think he does. I think you're just making things up. We'll, we'll look into this. <laughs> of all people, Adam Levine. We'll look into this. <laughs> More of a George Harrison, I would say. Maybe it's not 
a thing for the whole band to do, but he wants to do it solo. During a visit to the offices of independent, independent music publisher Pierre Southern, Holly met Maria Elena Santiago, their receptionist. In June 1958, Holly asked Maria on a date, and five hours into that first date, he handed a rose to Maria and asked her to marry him. Wow, a real romantic <laughs> buddy. <laughs> Maria, for her part, did not run screaming, but was rather enchanted by the gesture. She did try to tell him that maybe he should get to know her a little better before marriage. But Buddy simply smiled and replied, I haven't got the time. So maybe he knew what was to come. Wow. Less than two months later, on August 15th, 1958, they were married in Buddy's hometown of Lubbock, Texas. Shortly after this, Holly began to suspect that band manager Norman Petty was transferring money from the band's royalties into his own account. Holly ended his association with Petty in December 1958, but his bandmates chose to keep Petty on as manager and split from Holly instead. Wow. Really? I How mean, did that go for them? Well, maybe they were feeling like the backup band to the Buddy Holly machine, um, but the split was amicable, and it seems everyone parted ways rather genially. Singer Paul Anka... <laughs> A oh, friend oh. of Holly's. He, he of uh, the guys get shirts fame. You're going to have to explain that to people. Oh, there's just a great video. Uh, there's a recording of, of Paul Anka yelling at his band. Um, after, recently, after right? After a performance. I, I, not that recently. <laughs> um, I would guess it's in the 90s or the 80s. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's just like, you know, the, the guys get shirts. Uh, and he, uh, he talking about what the guys are supposed to be wearing. Cause I think one of the guys showed up in a t-shirt and mm -hmm. he's just like, what the fuck is that? He's, he was swearing at him and stuff. And he's threatening to fire all of them. And at one point he goes like, uh, I, I, I'll cut you out. And you know, when I slice, I slice like a fucking hammer. He says all this nonsense. <laughs> uh, it's great. Look up Paul Anka. I don't know. Meltdown. <laughs> well, at this point, uh, he was a friend of Buddy Holly's, and he later said that Holly realized he had to go back on tour very soon after this breakup for a couple of reasons. He needed money because of Petty's apparent thievery, and he wanted to raise additional funds to move to New York City with Maria because she was newly pregnant. Uh-oh. You mean uh-oh. Well, They're he married. Just, he it's just fine. got all his money stolen by his crooked manager. <laughs> yeah, it's tough. Holly assembled the winter dance... Speaking of the colonel. Yeah, seriously. Holly assembled the winter dance party tour lineup for this money-making end, and it included hit artists of the time like Big Bopper, J.P. Richardson, Richie Valens, Dion and the Belmonts. Oh, I love Dion. Mm-hmm. And band members Waylon Jennings on bass, Tommy Alzup on guitar, and Carl Bunch on drums, as well as additional vocalist Frankie Sardo. Wait, so did Dion and Waylon Jennings almost get on this plane? Yep. Wow. We'll get there. But now that we're at the Winter Dance Party Tour, let's talk a little bit about the Big Bopper and Richie Valens, the other solo headliners. J.P. Richardson, known as the Big Bopper, was a musician, songwriter, and disc jockey who rose to fame initially on the Texas radio station KTRM. Oh, he was a disc jockey. He was. Now, this I didn't know. So did the like phone bit start as like a radio bit before he worked it into a single? Well, I'll, <laughs> I'll go into it, but he loved a novelty song, yeah. and that was very novel. I bet. <laughs> Richardson got his name, The Big Bopper, from the dance craze, The Bop, and made a name for himself as KTRM's main attraction. He was known for his zany radio antics, <laughs> and he undertook a sleepless disc-a-thon in 1957. So a disc-a-thon was a popular radio gimmick at the time where the DJ had to stay awake playing record after record continuously on air for as many days as possible before passing out. Uh -huh. How many days did he make it, the old, the old bopper? Well, he was trying to break the record, and he undertook his own disc-a-thon in May. Uh, and the original record was, I think, five days and change. Three days in, he wearily asked radio announcer Jerry Boynton, Jer, do you think I'm going to die? Uh, and Boynton replied, JP, I think you are. <laughs> with the help of cold towels, coffee mixed with adrenaline, 
which apparently is a thing. Well, in the 40s, maybe. The 50s. In the 50s, maybe. (laughs) And an iron will, the bopper continued on for two more days, setting the world record of 122 hours and eight minutes continuously on air. Just chugging adrenaline. Literally. In coffee. During the marathon, he had begun to hallucinate, because that's what happens when you don't sleep. And drink adrenaline? Yeah. And he told of foreseeing his own death in one of the visions, reporting later that the other side wasn't that bad. Did he say how he died? Uh, I did not find that information, but maybe it was just one big trip. I mean, really, what's the point of seeing your own death if it's like, but I don't know how it happens or when it will be. (laughs) Yeah. The bopper, who also played guitar, began his musical career as a songwriter, writing the hit song White Lightning for country star George Jones. As a DJ, he noted the popularity of novelty songs at Uh the time. Uh, Check our series Ain't It Kitschy for Mm -hmm. uh, plenty of novelty song material. Mm -hmm. And these included the songs Purple People Eater and Witch Doctor. And he decided to capitalize on the trend as only an ain't it kitschy king could with a song called The Purple People Eater Meets the Witch Doctor. Really? (laughs) Yes. Oh, I don't have that clipped. Well, because the B-side to this single was the song Chantilly Lace. Mm. Both were released in June of 1958, but Chantilly Lace was the one that really caught on despite its B-side status. And it began picking up airplay through July and August and eventually reached number six on the pop charts and spent 22 weeks in the national top 40. Two things. First, how did this guy not get sued for doing The Witch Doctor Meets the Purple People Eater? Genuinely no idea. Why doesn't Dave Seville get to sue the pants off that guy? I think copyright was different. I think the the laws really changed in the 70s. Okay. Okay. So that was part one. Uh, Part two. I pulled this clip. I just want our listeners, if you sharp-eared listeners, if you have listened to Ain't It Kitschy, um, just pay attention to how similar this is to novelty hit Batman, Wolfman, Frankie Stein, or Dracula. <laughs> Hello, baby. Yeah, this is the Big Bopper speaking. You can tell he's a DJ because he sort of covers up his, you know, where the songwriting may lack, he <laughs> he gets in with a gimmick or a voice. Mm-hmm. He's narrating the song. Yeah, there's all that, hey, <laughs> baby. Mm-hmm. Um, if anybody hasn't seen Walk Hard, the Dewey Cox story. It and is, there is a big bopper in Walk Hard. Well, that's what I was going to bring up mm-hmm. is, a, a, if you haven't seen it, it, it's funnier and smarter than you think it is. Mm-hmm. Lot of, I'll agree with that. A lot of really smart rock history jokes in it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the big bopper is in it and they have him just like literally with a phone on stage, <laughs> like miming the uh, thing like, hey, b- yes, this is the big bopper speaking. And then uh, Dewey Cox is just backstage like how am i gonna follow this (laughs) well bopper uh he was one of the pioneers of the music video and you can find it on youtube he does that exact thing in his music video for this song Uh, before richardson left for the winter dance party tour he scored a second hit with the novelty song the big bopper's wedding (laughs) (laughs) Uh, and in real life he had also married to adrian wenner had a four-year-old daughter named deborah and was expecting a son to be born soon after the tour was completed so both the bopper and buddy holly's wives were pregnant oh jesus just piling tragedy on tragedy yeah he decided to go on the tour to promote these new hits and help secure the financial security his family so desperately wanted how old were these guys The bopper was the oldest. He was, I mean, not on the tour probably, but he was 28 
and he looks like he's 47. Yes, in I'm pictures. looking at the album cover right here. He, he is, is younger than us by he, by years. He's easily 56 years old in this picture, <laughs> um, and he sells used cars. Buddy Holly was only 22, and Richie Valens, who I will talk about next, was 17. Oh, so literally, he a was not child. old enough to to buy a lottery ticket. So Richie Valens. He was 17 years old when he embarked on the Winter Dance Party Tour, and he was born Richard Valenzuela in Pacoima, Los Angeles, California, to Mexican immigrants. He was brought up listening to traditional Mexican mariachi music along with flamenco guitar, R&B, and up-tempo jump blues. He began his musical journey at the young age of five, taking up guitar and trumpet and later teaching himself the drums. And very similarly to Paul McCartney, um, he was so desperate to learn guitar that he just, he was a lefty, but he learned it right, righty. Hmm. So he was very good. <laughs> at the age of 15, a horrible tragedy occurred in the young Valenzuela's life that would form some of his greatest fears and act as a horrible premonition of things to come. On January 31st, 1957, Richie was absent from school attending the funeral of his beloved grandfather. Shortly after the family returned home from the service, a deafening explosion was heard from outside. Richie and his older brother Bob ran outside and saw basically one of my greatest fears. Uh, they saw a plane plummeting to the earth engulfed in flames. Oh my God. Mm-hmm. Quickly, the family jumped into a car and drove in the general direction of the plane's downward trajectory, and they would find the wreckage of the aircraft on, ironically, Richie's school playground. He was in junior high at this time. Three students were tragically killed in the crash due to the location. They had been on the playground at the time that the plane hit the playground. Uh, the pilot was also killed, and 90 others were injured. Does this, were planes his greatest fear? Well, they became that, yeah. Because <laughs> one of the students killed on the playground, incidentally, was Richie's best friend. Every day, Richie would sit on the same playground playing guitar for his fellow students, and he was convinced that, had he not been at his grandfather's funeral, he would have been among the fatalities that day, right beside his friend. Hmm. Recurring nightmares of the disaster would lead to Valens' fear of flying, which he was only starting to overcome after launching his music career. At least it didn't lead to a fear of singing on the playground. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> when he was 16, Richie was invited to join a local band, making his performing debut in October 1957. At one of these performances, he was spotted by Bob Keen, owner of Hollywood label Delphi Records, who had been given a tip about a performer known in the area as the Little Richard of San Fernando. And his name just happens to be Richie also? <laughs> yes. Impressed by Valens' musicianship, Keen invited the teenager to audition at his home recording studio, and he was signed to Delphi in May 1958. At this point, he took the name Richie, since, as you noted, there were several famous Richards around at the time. Uh -huh. And he shortened his surname to Valens from Valenzuela to widen his appeal beyond any obvious ethnic group. Because unfortunately, having a super Latino last name would have been difficult for him. He entered the studio in July 1958 with a backing band, and the recordings out of these sessions would include Come On, Let's Go, Donna, and the now massively famous La Bamba, which would eventually sell over a million copies and reach gold status, along with being a pop chart hit sung entirely in Spanish. <laughs> Even with his singing style, it, it is sort of, um, you know, mariachi, mm -hmm. uh, but with that rock and roll beat. 
Yeah, he's really bringing the Chicano flavor. And with all of these songs, and, and this one included, you know, Sean and I are sitting here kind of smiling and grooving a little bit. They're all very infectious. Yeah, uh, the Big Bop were less so than the others, but yes. Oh, I, I enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, now you're singing Batman Wolfman. I can't tell the difference. Lou Diamond Phillips, who played Valens in the film La Bamba, told Behind the Music that, quote, you've got to realize that his career was eight months long from the time he was discovered and recorded the first album until February 3rd of 59. He packed a lot of living into eight months, you know? That is... When you think of it that way, it's wild. Well, and it's also the worst thing that ever happened to him, obviously. Of course, yeah. The demands of Valens' recording career would force him to drop out of high school, and the Winter Dance Party Tour was one of his first major concert tours after this point. So now with all of that backstory behind us, we'll get into the Winter Dance Party Tour and the day the music died after the break. As you've heard, this very special episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie is brought to you by our favorite record store, Static Era Records. If you're local to us here in Connecticut or even coming in from New York, you can find their retail storefront just a short walk away from the Metro North Stop in downtown Milford, Connecticut, where you can bring in your own records to sell and trade. If you'd like to buy some of their records online, which we absolutely encourage you to do, go to www.staticerarecords.com. Static Era has everything. If you know the Connecticut and New York hardcore punk scene, you know Jay Reason and Static Era Records. And this is kind of a storefront for the record label, as well as stocking a bunch of other cool stuff. Uh, records, action figures, Funko Pops, you name it. If it's rock or goth or nerdy, uh, Jay's probably got something for you in there. And it's uh, it's just a really cool vibe of a store it's a cool place that i like to be in you can find classics there from rob zombie to springsteen to our current household favorite bat out of hell check them out at static records.com and on instagram and facebook at static era records and don't forget to tell them ain't it scary sent you welcome back when last we left you caroline had just caught us up on the career deets the um, story so far, if you will, on bu- on Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and the Big Bopper. Um, three of the musicians who are set to be on the Winter Dance Party Tour. Winter Dance Party Tour? Mm-hmm. Which we know, uh, and they unfortunately do not yet, um, is set to end in tragedy. Now, Caroline, you mentioned that like Dion and the Belmonts were also on this tour? They were, Yes. Uh, they weren't as popular, I I would think, um, at well, this time as as the other ones. But their, yeah, their hits all came in the in the '60s. I just um, we could have lost Dion too. Mm-hmm. We could have. So now it's time to take a walk on the dark side, as one of our sources would say, and dive into the events leading up to the tragic day the music died, February third, nineteen fifty nine. The Hollies had some strange premonitions before Buddy left on the tour. Maria and Buddy both had terrible prophetic dreams. Maria recounted a nightmare in which she was standing in a vast open area, much like a farm. All of a sudden, I could hear noises like shouting, and it got closer and closer. She saw a ball of fire falling from the heavens and was convinced it would hit her, but it passed by and exploded in the field. As she approached the site of the crash, all she could see was a giant burning hole in the ground. When Maria awakened, she told Buddy the story, very upset, and he related that at the same time Maria was suffering through this nightmare, he was having a dream that he was flying in a small plane with her and his brother Larry. For some reason in the dream, Larry convinced Buddy to leave Maria behind on top of a building, reassuring him that they'd return to pick her up. The dream created so much guilt within Holly that he broke into tears when recounting it to Maria, saying he couldn't understand why he left her and she wasn't with him. Maria would often come on tour with Holly to assist and keep him company, do his laundry, things like that. 
and she had her bags packed to go with him for this one as well. But on the day that they were to leave, he insisted she stay behind due to her morning sickness for the health of her and her baby. How long after that uh, weird dream was this? Oh, it, this was soon, like soon before. I mean, that can't not have gone through his head when he's like, you know what, you stay behind. Mm-hmm. It's very metaphorical. Another strange story relating to Holly and premonitions of his death comes from legendary British recording engineer and producer Joe Meek, known for his work on space age and experimental pop music. In 1958, Meek had become fascinated with the occult and began using Ouija boards and tarot cards. During one tarot session, Meek, a friend of his named Faud, I think, Arabic, and Jimmy Miller of the band Jimmy Miller and the Barbecues, experienced a frightening connection to the unknown. Now I desperately need to hear Jimmy <laughs> Jimmy Miller and the Barbecues? Mm-hmm. Faud delivered to them the results of some of his automatic writing during the session. Letters spelling out February the 3rd, Buddy Holly, and dies. Meek, terrified of the implications, began contacting record companies, publishers, and anyone else he could think of to try and get in touch with the singer to deliver this prophecy of doom. He really took it seriously. Finally, during Holly's tour in England in 1958, Meek was able to deliver the message to him, and Holly politely thanked the producer for his concern and assured him he'd always be careful on February 3rd. Well, not careful enough. Well, happily, February 3rd, 1958 came and went without incident, and Meek was very relieved. Unfortunately, it seems he hadn't accounted that it could be a future year that had been prophesied, which he would find out in 1959. Meek, for his part, met his own tragic end, killing his landlady and then himself with a single-barreled shotgun on February 3rd, 1967. Perhaps this was his date of doom as well. There's got to be an easier way to get your security deposit back. Yeah. Valens also had some strange premonitions before the tour. Just before he left, he visited Guardian Angels Church with his friend Gail Smith, praying for a safe journey. He told his friend that he was afraid of flying, but had been getting used to it and might even do so during the tour. Gail warned him that it was snowy and storming in the north, where they'd be touring, and perhaps insensitively asked, What'll you do if you crash? Valens responded, I'll land on my guitar. Valens's mother also had a premonition concerning Richie's death before the tour, but didn't tell him as she didn't want to interfere with his career. I don't think, what will you do if you crash wasn't insensitive before well, they crashed. Well, it's like, if, I mean, if they if he crashes, like, it's not, a, I mean, what is he going to do? What's What kind of question yeah, is that? It's weirdly worded. I think she means like, what if you crash? Don't go. Yeah. For the winter dance party tour, Buddy Holly had hired the aforementioned Tommy Alzup, Charlie Bunch, and Waylon Jennings to be his backing band, replacing the Crickets. Jennings was one of Holly's best friends and a DJ at the time. Holly bought him a bass and told him he had two weeks to learn how to play it. (laughs) Though Jennings really had no clue what he was doing, he was able to memorize his finger positions for each song by the time the tour kicked off. He is now known as a country music star right one of one of the all-time best many mm-hmm. will tell you people old-time country fans will tell you now none of the group wanted to go and do this tour during the brutal midwestern winter but they all needed the money unfortunately the booking company seemed to have just complete and utter disregard for the conditions they forced the musicians to endure There was a performance scheduled every single day from January 23rd, 1959 to February the 15th. And instead of systematically circling around the Midwest through a series of venues in close proximity to each other, you know, if one's 20 miles away, you go, you do those two at the same time, you know. And you take a bus from venue to venue. Mm -hmm. The distances between the venues when scheduling were not taken into consideration at all, and distances between some stops exceeded 400 miles. The bands also had to travel continuously for up to 10 to 12 hours in freezing temperatures, because there were no off days, 
And since most of the interstate highway system hadn't yet been built, this meant most of the driving time was on rural two-lane highways rather than your typical modern expressways. Buddy Holly historian Bill Griggs later stated, it was like they threw darts at a map. It was the tour from hell. (laughs) And this is just when you're... So they are driving to all these dates. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, Griggs also noted that the buses used on the tour were reconditioned school buses not good enough for school kids. And while the musicians traveled on a single bus together, the tour had already gone through five in the first 11 days of the tour due to each one breaking down and having to replace them one after the other. So they were on their fifth bus? Mm Mm-hmm. They had no roadies, so the musicians themselves had to load and unload the equipment at every stop And the buses were absolutely not equipped for the harsh weather, which could drop to as low as negative 36 degrees Fahrenheit, which is negative 38 degrees Celsius. All right, Bopper, you're getting your own prop phone next time. (laughs) Tommy Alzup, Holly's guitarist, would relate that during one evening traveling in Wisconsin, as the school bus they were on drove up an incline, it began moving slower and slower in the snow until eventually it stopped completely. And the driver told the group that the bus had literally frozen. <laughs> the you, me- you guys wanted a winter dance party tour. <laughs> you can't dance if you're f- frozen, though. The musicians were forced to huddle together under blankets, burn newspapers in the aisle of the bus, and drink shots to try and keep warm. What, they don't like rock and roll in Florida and Texas? <laughs> this is what the people wanted, I guess. They told stories to pass the time and tried to warm up. Holly's drummer, Carl Bunch, was unable to fight off the cold and contracted frostbite in his feet, missing the next tour date, February 2nd, the last show before the accident. It was these particularly hellish conditions that pushed Holly to take the initiative and charter a small plane after the February 2nd show at the Surf Ballroom in Clear Lake, Iowa. He just couldn't take it anymore. Morale was diminishing, people were getting sick, and they still had half the tour to go. Oh, Jesus. So so is his plan now to fly them to every date? He he wanted to at least do this one. Because there wasn't even supposed to have been a February 2nd show, but the performance at the Surf Ballroom had been scheduled when an open date was found on the tour. So taking the plane 400 miles to the next stop at this point, he could at least get some shut eye, launder his clothes, and just get out of the cold for a little while. Manager of the surf ballroom, Carol Anderson, called Dwyer Flying Service in Mason City to charter the plane to Fargo, North Dakota's Hector Airport. Now, it seems Holly originally intended for his bandmates Waylon Jennings and Tommy Alzup to come with him, but fate would intervene on that account. As Jennings and Alzup would later recall, the Big Bopper first approached Jennings (laughs) about possibly taking his seat on the flight instead. He had been suffering from a terrible flu since the beginning of the tour, And time to rest and be out of the cold must have sounded like heaven to him. And with the extra time, he could also go see a doctor before the next performance. Jennings enjoyed spending time with the other musicians, and it wasn't a great sacrifice for him to switch with the bopper, especially after Richardson offered Jennings his new sleeping bag to use. Nice. Zero degrees, (laughs) baby. When Holly found out that Jennings had given up his seat on the flight to Richardson, joking to him, well, I hope your old bus freezes up, Jennings responded humorously, well, I hope your old plane crashes. Oops. And this is a rejoinder that Jennings would say haunted him for the rest of his life. I'm sure it does. More surprisingly than the bopper requesting to go on the plane was Richie Valens, who asked Alsup for his seat as well, despite his previous fear of flying. So that's how you know shit was bad it's so on miserable. this tour. Because mm-hmm. Richie hates the idea of a plane, right? Mm-hmm. He's just getting used to flying. He was probably also ill, and <clears throat> he asked Alsup, are you going to let me fly, guy? And Alsup replied, no, let's flip a coin for it. And Alsup was set to be the third person in that plane up till 
minutes before they left for the airport. Wow. And they did settle it on a coin flip? Mm Mm-hmm. He later elaborated, I don't know why I said we should flip for it, because I'd been telling him no all evening. But I pulled a half dollar out of my pocket. I've never understood what made me. It just happened. I flipped the 50-cent piece and said, call it. Richie said heads, and it came down heads. At this, Valens is said to have remarked, this is the first time I've ever won anything in my life. Oh. It's devastating. Now, as a possible contradiction to some of these events, singer Dion DeMucci from touring band Dion and the Belmonts, and you noted Sean, he's also the Dion of later hits as The Wanderer and Run Around Stew, Sue. Run Around Stew. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> Run Around Sue. He stated in a 2009 interview that he'd been offered a seat on the plane, and it was him and Valens that flipped for the seat. Dion stated that he actually won this toss, but the $36 fare Holly was requiring to get on the flight happened to be equal to the monthly rent his parents paid for their apartment. And Dion said he couldn't justify the indulgence, which would come out to about $320 today. Gotcha. Which is what plane tickets cost. Sure. Yeah. I'm not sure how much stock I put into this version of events because Jennings and Alzep have always agreed on their version. Uh, maybe Dion wanted to be a part of the history or the mythology of this moment. Or, you know, memories morph in the mind over time, too. Mm -hmm. If he heard that anecdote about flipping the coin and then he didn't think about it for a couple of years and then he just thinks that that was a thing he remembers. Yeah, I mean, whatever the reality, that's one other version. But either way, it ended up that Buddy Holly, J.P. Big Bopper Richardson and Richie Valens were the ones getting on the plane that evening. As we mentioned before, Holly was 22, Richardson was 28, and Valens was only 17. Their pilot, Roger Peterson, was also only 21, and he was described as a young married man who built his life around flying. A popular misconception due to the uh, McLean song was that the plane that they boarded that day was named the American Pie. Uh But (laughs) it's it's like a Snopes thing. There's really no records of it ever having any name. It was simply a 1947 single-engined, V-tailed Beechcraft 35 Bonanza with registration number N3794N, and it could fit three passengers plus a pilot. That, that's all planes usually get. It's not like a retired guy's boat yeah. where it's like the 19th hole or something. <laughs> and uh, the men also brought everyone's laundry on board with them so they could do everybody's laundry before the next stop. After the surf ballroom performance ended, Carol Anderson drove Holly, Valens, and Richardson to Mason City Municipal Airport for their flight. It was lightly snowing, and though there were deteriorating weather conditions reported along the planned route the weather briefings pilot peterson received failed to relay the information to deadly results the plane took off from runway 17 at 12 55 a.m local time february 3rd company owner dwyer witnessed the takeoff from a platform outside the control tower he was able to see the aircraft's taillight for most of the brief flight which started with a 180-degree left turn to pass east of the airport, climbing to about 800 feet above ground level before an additional left turn toward a northwesterly direction. Then, the taillight was observed gradually descending until it disappeared. Around 1 a.m., the pilot failed to make radio contact or respond to repeated attempts at communication. Later that morning, after still hearing no word from the pilot since departure, Dwyer took off in another airplane to retrace the planned route. So the plane took off and then pretty much immediately after hitting a cruising altitude started going down? I get the impression that he couldn't see after a certain point and didn't realize that that's what that meant. But, you know, the conditions were bad and he probably felt like he just, they were out of his eye line. So minutes later, around 9.35 a.m., Dwyer spotted the wreckage less than six miles northwest of the airport. Dwyer called the sheriff's office and Deputy Bill McGill was dispatched to the crash site, which was a cornfield belonging to farmer Albert Jewell. It was a horrific scene. 
Now, the, sec- uh, the next several minutes will be describing the results of a plane crash, as well as autopsy reports. So if you are sensitive to these things, please skip ahead a few. Trust me, I am sympathetic to that feeling because as someone with a deep, deep fear of flying, this is truly terrible stuff. Um, can I skip ahead a few? <laughs> uh, if you want. <laughs> The Bonanza plane had hit the ground at high speed, estimated to have been about 170 miles per hour. It was banked steeply to the right and faced nose down. The wing tip, the right wing tip had struck the ground first, sending the plane cartwheeling across the frozen field for 540 feet before coming to a rest at a wire fence cordoning off the jewel property. Holly and Valens had been ejected from the fuselage and laid near the plane's wreckage. Richardson's body had been thrown over Jewel's fence into the cornfield of neighbor Oscar Moffat. Peterson's body was entangled with the wreckage. After the bodies were identified by surf ballroom manager Carol Anderson, they were inspected by county coroner Ralph Smiley, which is a tough name for a coroner. That is, um, (laughs) yeah. There wasn't a full autopsy re- performed, um, but the external examination gives enough t- detail, to be honest. So here's what these reports state, and here's where it gets especially graphic. Buddy Holly was partially clothed in a yellow leather jacket, which was split down the back. His skull was also split down the center through the forehead, and half of the brain tissue was missing and unable to be recovered. <sighs> There were multiple gashes on his face and bleeding from both ears due to gross brain trauma. His chest cavity suffered major crushing injuries, and his arms, thighs, and legs had numerous fractures and breaks. The gross brain trauma was what killed Holly, and it occurred on impact. Richie Valens was unrecognizable. He had breaks and fractures to his arms and legs and numerous gashes and lacerations to his body. The entirety of his head was badly crushed, with a large gaping wound across his entire temple region. The right side of his face was near completely flattened, and the right eye socket was mangled. He almost certainly died upon impact with his brain eviscerated before the nerves could transport pain signals to the rest of his body. (sighs) J.P. Richardson's skull was completely split, almost down to the eye socket, and the majority of his brain tissue was exposed through the wound. His head was badly misshapen, with the right side flattened and crushed. Both arms were severely deformed and nearly crushed, and the legs suffered gashes and fractures. His chest was also severely crushed. He died on impact. In January 2007, Jay Richardson, his son, requested that his father's body be exhumed and an autopsy be performed in response to an internet rumor about guns being fired aboard the aircraft and Richardson initially surviving the crash. Um, come on. <clears throat> well, his, the, since the body was found a ways away from everything else, they thought maybe he had crawled from the crash but then succumbed to his injuries. However, the independent autopsy on Richardson confirmed that his catastrophic brain injury meant it didn't have time to process any sensations, including pain from the actual crash, and was also the cause of his immediate death. No signs of foul play, including gunfire, was discovered. Lastly, pilot Roger Peterson had suffered numerous traumatic lacerations, fractures, and a rupture of the interventricular septum of the heart and the severing of the thoracic aorta. There was also a laceration with almost complete severance of the brain stem. So, um, so yeah, the, those are the gory details. So those, past it. Those are all instant deaths? Yes. Cause of death was cited as gross trauma to the brain for the three musicians and brain damage for the pilot and pretty much instant death before they would even have felt any pain. So at least there is that comfort. Tragically, the families of the musicians learned of their deaths not from a direct call from the police or the tour managers, but from the news. The police couldn't get to them before the reporters? Well, that wasn't the thing at the time. It wasn't standard. Maria Elena Hawley learned of Buddy's death via a television news report, and the trauma caused her to have a miscarriage shortly after. Hawley's mother, on hearing the news on the radio at home in Lubbock, Texas, screamed and collapsed. Tommy Alsup's family was informed that he'd been in the crash as well, when it was thought that there were five victims in the accident. This is the guy who flipped for it? 
Yes. Uh, But thankfully, he had called his family just prior to let them know he was all right. The Valenzuelas would not be so lucky. They too found out through the news, either through reports or Valens' schoolmates approaching the family after hearing the news themselves. Holly's former bandmates, the Crickets, also found out through the news. Strangely, the pair had tried to contact Holly on the night of the crash in hopes of getting the band back together. But sadly, they weren't able to reach him, and it was simply not meant to be. Um, they knew he was on a tour. Like, it's probably not the best time to call him. Well, it's just an interesting coincidence. Yeah, for sure. This traumatic revelation of their loved one's deaths prompted official regulations surrounding the notification of deaths to be changed across the board. Since then, a policy has been adopted by authorities not to disclose victims' names until their families have been informed, which is something that you can find in a lot of situations from accidents, school shootings. um, Any death. Yeah. Yeah. The police won't talk to reporters until uh, about the, they won't identify the, mm-hmm. the person until the family knows. And that's because of this particularly. I didn't know that. Yeah. The official report on the crash by the Civil Aeronautics Board determined that pilot Roger Peterson was too inexperienced to be flying during a snowstorm. And despite four years of flying experience, he was not yet qualified to operate in weather that required flying solely by reference to instruments, as in snow, where the horizon is not often visible. Because then you you end up with the plane um, upside down or sideways. Yeah, so Peterson had failed an instrument check ride or a practical test nine months before the accident, and he had received his instrument training on planes equipped with a conventional artificial horizon. So this is this kind of gets into the nitty gritty, but it, it's the little, the little. Um, it's like a compass for for the horizon. It, yeah, it shows you that the it shows you inside the plane. But the problem is the Bonanza that they were flying in was equipped with an older type of gyroscope, which displayed aircraft pitch altitude completely At- opposite. Pitch attitude, right? Attitude, yes. Um, With a completely opposite way than the instrumentation Peterson had learned on. So that meant that Peterson could have been headed straight for the ground, thinking, due to his experience with other instruments, that he was actually moving upward. Crucially, the weather briefing provided to Peterson was determined to be seriously inadequate, failing to even mention the adverse flying conditions that should have been highlighted and would have likely factored into Peterson's decision making. There were no malfunctions found in the engine or other equipment and the landing gear was still up. So it was concluded that the probable cause of the accident was the pilot's unwise decision to attempt a flight that required skills he did not have and possibly didn't know he needed for this particular flight. So just horrible all around. Somehow, wildly, the winter dance party went on. Wait, what? They finished the tour. With what, just Dion? Uh, 15-year-old Bobby V, who later scored hits like Take Good Care of My Baby, uh, he filled in for Buddy Holly the next performance, and eventually Waylon Jennings finished the tour in Holly's spot. Oh. So I don't know how Waylon Jennings and Tommy Alzup kept playing on this tour, but they did, and Dion. Right. Well, Jennings, apparently, if he finished the tour in Holly's spot, it sounds like he was singing for, for the mm-hmm. end. Uh, maybe he was singing some of his own tunes, or maybe, I mean, he and he and the other, he and Alsup knew Buddy's songs. Yeah. Funerals for Holly, Richardson, and Valens were held individually. Maria Elena Holly did not attend her husband's funeral, later saying in an interview that, quote, In a way, I blame myself. I was not feeling well when he left. I was two weeks pregnant. I feel like she was more pregnant than that, but maybe this is just... I don't think you'd have morning sickness if you were only two weeks pregnant, but anyway. Oh, I see. Uh, And I wanted Buddy to stay with me, but he had scheduled that tour. It was the only time I wasn't with him, and I blame myself because I know that if I had gone along, Buddy never would have gotten into that airplane. Annual memorial concerts have been held at the Surf Ballroom since 1979, and various various monuments have been erected for the victims, including outside of the Surf Ballroom, the crash site, and in honor of each of the victims at their resting places. Eventually, Don McLean released his song American Pie, which officially dubbed the day of the accident the day the music died, 
Uh, and this is the name that's come to be known by ever since, symbolizing the loss of innocence of the early rock and roll generation. Uh, was it Maria that, was she the, the widow that he's talking mm-hmm. about at the beginning of that song? Yep. There's something known as the Buddy Holly curse that still lingers to this day, begun by the day the music died and carried through assorted tragedies suffered by those who had associated with him. The murder-suicide of Joe Meek, the terrible car accident death of fellow rocker and friend Eddie Cochran, Holly's crickets replacement David Box, who also died in a small plane crash, and many more. However, you could just as easily chalk up the tragedies to the live-fast, die-hard lifestyle that was rock and roll in the 60s, but the coincidences are worth noting. Yeah, small aircraft. Famous people die in small aircraft a lot. Literally never like, going on a small aircraft. Yeah. So. It, it's, it is. Never. It's, I will never. It's not worth it. It's so much more dangerous than a big <laughs> airplane. But the legacies of the three stars killed on the day the music died still shine on to this day. Uh, The Big Bopper has popped up in a ton of places, from Stephen King's short story, You Know They Got a Hell of a Band, to The Simpsons, to The X-Files, and references in songs like Good Enough by Van Halen, where Sammy Hagar begins it by singing, Hello, baby, as Richardson did so memorably in Chantilly Lace. Buddy Holly was hugely influential to the up-and-coming rockers of the 60s, with two huge fans being John Lennon and Paul McCartney, who were inspired by Holly's insect-themed band name, The Crickets, and chose to name their band The Beatles in tribute. And uh, for what it's worth, McCartney now owns the publishing rights to Holly's song catalog, so big fan. Hmm. Does he own the rights to his own song catalog as well now? Uh, I think at least most of it. Mm. Two nights before Holly's death, a 17-year-old Bob Dylan attended the Winter Dance Party performance in Duluth, Minnesota, and later said during his Grammy acceptance speech in 1998 that, I was three feet away from him, and he looked at me, and I just have some sort of feeling that he was with us all the time we were making this record in some kind of way. Others heavily influenced by the bespectacled rocker were the Rolling Stones, Elton John, who adopted his glasses look to imitate Holly. He did not need glasses. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Is he the first person to wear fashion glasses? (laughs) Uh, Maybe. Uh, He also influenced The Clash, Eric Clapton, and many others. Famously, Weezer frontman Rivers Cuomo was also inspired by the singer and helped carry on his memory with the song Buddy Holly. Still rocking those glasses. Mm Mm-hmm. Richie Valens is widely considered the first Latino to successfully cross over into mainstream rock, and his influence has spurred on generations of artists from Los Lobos to Carlos Santana to Selena. He was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2001. He's even found a bit of a renaissance recently on TikTok, of all places, with clips from his song We Belong Together, which is one of my favorites, becoming a popular audio on the platform. You're mine And we belong together Yes, we belong together For eternity It's true crime time. UPI reports that the father of Susan Cox Powell, a Utah resident who disappeared in 2009, now feels confident that her remains have been uncovered after renewed efforts to find her body. Is this a murder I'm familiar with? I've definitely watched documentaries on it, so I might have ranted to you about it because it's an (laughs) infuriating story. Powell was last seen in December 2009, and possibly until now, her body or whereabouts were never found. She is suspected to have been killed by her husband, piece of shit, Josh Powell. (laughs) Is that his, uh, that's a given name? Uh, For me, yeah. 
He was a person of interest in her case, but never charged, and later killed himself and their two children. Oh. Mm-hmm. So he's 100% guilty of that one. I, I don't think there has to be allegedly he murdered her. Susan Cox's remains and clothing may have been found in a desert mine by a team, including reality TV star David Sparks of the series Diesel Brothers. Um, okay. Back up a half step <laughs> and explain Diesel Brothers to me. I don't really know Diesel Brothers, um, but it seems to be a YouTube it sounds like thing. It, it sounds like it would be a... You know, Braxton family rules situation (laughs) with uh, Vin Diesel's two brothers, but not Vin Diesel. (laughs) Well, uh, David Sparks and company were operating on a tip that Cox's body may have been disposed of in one of the many defunct and closed mines in the area. This is also a theory that's popped up in her case many times. The mine is located near where Josh Powell claimed to have been camping the night his wife disappeared. And though it had been investigated years before, nothing had been found. These are also very dangerous. They're old, abandoned mines. Uh, Sure. A lot of them are half filled in. So there's not a lot of investigating they can do. Bones and clothing were discovered this week during the renewed efforts. And they will be sent to a forensics lab and analyzed for DNA to see if this is actually what remains of Susan. So for the Cox family's sake, I hope they have finally gotten the closure they so desperately have needed. Okay, so I don't know anything about this case. It sounds like something, we'll talk about it sometime for sure. You might want to cover on this show at some point. Yeah, it's just it's. I mean, it, you you think this this episode was like very dark? This is a very dark case. Okay, it, it involves you know domestic violence, Mormonism, uh, creepy obsessions, stalking. I mean, it's a crazy case. And now the Diesel brothers. Yeah, well, at least those aren't as dark, I assume, and uh, they're doing some good. So I hope that they've helped the pa- uh, the Cox family find some closure. That's it for this episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Ain't It Scary, and check out our website at ain'titscary.com. You can support the show by supporting our sponsors and becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash ain't it scary. And please subscribe to the show and throw us a five star review on Apple Podcasts and also now on Spotify. We'll be forever grateful. Yep. And come over and join us on Patreon. Um, Go over there to hear me reading a Lovecraft story to uh, Caroline currently. Um, Also, oh, we mentioned earlier in this episode, Ain't It Kitschy? You can hear about Mm -hmm. um, stuff much sillier than anything the Big Bopper could ever have dreamed of. (laughs) Um, Special thanks to those already joining us over there, especially our top tier patrons, Nate Curtis, Sean O'Donnell, Jared Chamberlain, Maria Ferrante, Robin McCabe, Comfy Mike, Alex Nakudis, I just played D&D with Alex last <laughs> night, Ryan Regan, and Christy Atchison. Thank you guys. We love you very much. See you next Thursday. Show created by Sean and Carrie McCabe. Music by Kyle Ryan. You can find Kyle at his YouTube channel, Music is a Verb. This has been a production of Longboy Media. Longboy Media.